But, um, this is Alexander Bell. You know, the very first use of the phone was for telemedicine. Somebody says, well, what, what does that mean? Well, he was working in the lab, and Watson was down the hall, and he spilled acid, and he yelled, Watson, come in here, I need you, and it came across the phone, and that was the first words that went across the telephone. So, so medically related, I suppose. Uh, multimedia computers really is not something new. I mean, it's, they've been around for about 20 years now. The World Wide Web, when we first started doing telemedicine in 1993, there were about 1,000 websites. I would say 900 of them were XXX websites. Um, and people thought we were crazy. Well, what would you use the web for? Now you, everything you want to do is, is web related. Uh, also, artificial intelligence and decision support systems and smart materials. Those bottom two lines become very, very important on the way to Mars, mainly because of the communication delay. Uh, the, the amount of bandwidth available you can see in the red uh, is, is really, uh, I mean, the bandwidth has gone up and the cost has come down. So when you, although every time I pay, pay my cable bill, I kind of wonder how that Roadrunner thing is, keeps getting more expensive, but, but it keeps getting faster, or so they say. So what are some of the challenging and remote environments? This is uh, Camp 2 on uh, Mount Everest. Uh, we sent a group up there back in 1998, 1999. Uh, if you're going to go outside at night to go to the bathroom, you better watch where you're going because otherwise you'll be falling the rest of your life. Um, you can see uh, the, the, the area behind where um, the astronaut is, that's sort of where people mull around and then they go up to the Kumba Icefall, which is that um, razor sharp ice in the back. By the way, how many people know how many pictures of Neil Armstrong there are, there, there are on the moon? Anybody? None. The only picture is this one. And it's him in the background taking a picture. And there's all, all kinds of stories about that. I'm not going to go down that path uh, about what those stories are. But uh, there are, there's only one still photograph. And it's really of Buzz Aldrin. But Neil Armstrong is the one taking the picture. So you see him in the shield. And this is a, uh, an EKG from um, Apollo 17. So they had, did have some cardiac problems uh, during that mission. So some of the challenges to do healthcare in these remote environments. When I talk about space flight, is we have limited resources. You can only put so much on the space shuttle, uh, which, thanks to the last two presidents, we don't have too much longer. Uh, so we have limited access to space, which means you have to speak uh, Russian and maybe one day Chinese, but that's another lecture. Uh, we also have limited access to knowledge. Now, in the space program, if, if something happens during flight, the astronauts can contact the ground, and, they, and the flight surgeons that work at the Mission Control Center, both in uh, Houston and in Moscow are able to bring through telemedicine and expertise to bear. Now, if they have to have an emergency appendectomy, it takes 24 hours to come home. So you can't just call 911 and have the ambulance show up. You have to plan and you're going to land in Kazakhstan and you land like a ballistic bullet. And I have a picture of, of what that looks like in a minute. Uh, but in the, in the developing world, in the real world, uh, you might have modern facilities, and I put a question mark there, uh, and this one in the lower right-hand corner is in Kenya. And this man here uh, had gone out to get water for his family, and a um, crocodile bit him, bit a big chunk of his arm off. He only had one arm, or one bone left in the arm. And so in a traditional or an old, old school way, he would have been amputated just below the elbow and wouldn't have an arm, and therefore would not have been as useful in society in his, in his particular culture uh, so through telemedicine and, and using low bandwidth telemedicine, by the way, that's a dial-up modem, 56K, 56 kilobits per second, we were able to actually uh, ascertain with plastic surgeons what we might do for this person. And when the surgical team got to uh, Kenya, they were able to uh, save this man's arm. And he can at least lift a bucket of water now instead of uh, not being able to do that. Uh, here's some gross pictures. Uh, not, not really that bad. So here's a, a soldier in the upper left-hand corner. He is, um, he receives an injury uh, near Balad. He's uh, immediately taken to surgery uh, there in this uh, tent hospital, you can see, uh, which is near uh, Fallujah. They actually uh, are able to uh, repair and sew him up. You can see, well, it's hard to see, but you can see like there's a masking tape that tells all the instructions about what needs to be done. The, the man, the soldier, in this case, man, could be a woman, are immediately taken then by uh, these airplanes. You can see a whole bunch of them in line to take off. I'm not sure if that was in Iraq. It could be right over here at Wright Pat, but uh, there's a lot of those planes flying back and forth. Uh, and so they put them in these, um, this, um, these litters, and it is kind of 
hard to use his pointer. You put him in these litters and imagine being at a rock concert. I know most of us don't go to rock concerts anymore, but imagine standing right by the speaker. I never did that, by the way. <laughs> but you can see it's really, really loud, maybe 140 decibels. It's very difficult to hear. So if all these medical monitors are beeping or chirping, and you can't hear them, and it's hard to see because it's, it's like the uh, dark room. Everything is red. And the reason being is they don't want to see the plane flying up over uh, a, a, you know, a, a space where they might be shot at or shot down. They then arrive uh, down here at Landstuhl in, um, in Germany. They, they reopen the same wound, do any repairs or any fixing up. Then they sew them back up again and send them to Walter Reed where they may be opened up a, a third time. And if you take somebody like Bob Wo uh, Woodruff, that happened to him several times. He had shrapnel wound in his neck uh, from the IED that, that uh, upset his um, convoy and uh, he still has shrapnel. Uh, his wife was telling us uh, a couple of uh, years ago there's a rock that penetrated to his neck, bypassed one carotid artery, and the rest came to rest with the other one, bypassing the vocal cords. Didn't touch the vocal cords or either one of the carotid arteries. That was quite, uh, quite a uh, miracle. So in, as I said earlier, in 1998, we did some work in Everest. We actually uh, have to take everything we need up to the space, to the place where we're gonna be. Same thing in the space program. Everything you need to take has to go on the shuttle or on the station. And the medical kits for the space station are probably, uh, you could probably put them all on this table and lay them out and, and show them. They're not, they're not really, they're comprehensive, but they're not really large. And I remember uh, back in 1990 when I first started working at the Johnson Space Center, somebody had a picture of the Mayo Clinic and a first aid kit, and it had a line through it that says, this is not the Mayo Clinic. It's just like a first aid kit you might have in the car or if you're anybody in the scouting at some point in their life, something small like that. <clears throat> well, here, Dr. Ken Kamler, uh, has anybody read the book Into Thin Air? Okay, this Ken Kamler is the doctor that saved, uh, I think his name is Beck, Beck Weathers. They, uh, they thought that uh, they came by him, I think it was in between Camp 3 and Camp 2, maybe Camp 2, where I showed you where they were sort of camped along the ridge, and they thought he was dead. So he came walking into, to, I guess it was Camp 2, he came walking into Camp 2 the next morning, and all the Sherpas who are very religious about the mountain um, thought, you know, they saw a ghost, and it turned out he had really bad frostbite on the nose and, and the fingers and so forth. And he, uh, Ken was able to, to save his life. He obviously had some, some permanent injury, uh, but you can see all the meds here in the center picture, and you can see, of course, them hiking up um, to the uh, to Hillary Step. And the reason why we did research up there was we were actually interested in looking at how you could provide, uh, through a telemedicine link, uh, uh, survivability and being able to be aware of where these climbers were uh, on, this, uh, on this hike. Now, to do surgery at that level probably be a little more challenging, uh, but it's, it, is, it is a possibility in the future, but it's not something that uh, I would recommend doing right now. We also did some work in the, in the Ecuador jungle. This is a mobile uh, van, sort of like a UPS, and I mean not a UPS truck, a, a Penske truck or a U-Haul truck. And it's outfitted uh, as a surgical suite, and you can see the surgeons here in the middle. The one that's on the far right is an anesthesiologist from Yale. We were linked by a 256K uh, satellite phones, Inmarsat satellite phones. So it gives 128 kilobits per second of bandwidth, and we were able to actually uh, transmit live what was going on with this case, and the anesthesiologist in Richmond, Virginia, which is where we used to be before he came to Cincinnati, was able to tell this anesthesiologist, hey, something's going on with the patient, which they didn't even see. Uh, or understand. And so the, the power of, of being able to link and transmit real-time information, and again, this, all these different research projects we're doing are building up to uh, the ultimate capability of being able to do uh, telesurgery. Now, if the uh, people who live in Ecuador don't like to go to uh, the American or European doctors coming in in this fancy van, they'll go see Steve Perry from Journey. Or I'm just kidding, that's, that's actually a shaman. A uh, medicine man who might have you chew on bark or eat some kind of pussy stuff from a tree. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it's again one of those cultural things. So now we jump into the space program. Um, this is an artist rendition from uh, a book, uh, Space Medicine and Physiology by uh, Huntoon Poole and Nikogosian, uh, all three in, uh, intimately involved in the space uh, medicine efforts at the Johnson Space Center and NASA headquarters. So just to highlight, how ground analogs and the space are related. There's no immediate return to Earth. Now, 
if you're in the jungle, there's no immediate return to definitive care, meaning you can't just go over here to Miami Valley Hospital or if you're down at UC, down at the University uh, Hospital. Distance is an issue. And distance, by the way, doesn't necessarily have to be from here to Columbus or from here to Indianapolis. It could be from here across the street. And that comes into play in, in, in bigger cities where you have people who are isolated for a variety of reasons. Limited communications, as I pointed out on the way to Mars, 22-minute delay one way. Uh, you have limited diagnosis, limited treatment, and, li and limited pharmaceuticals. And by the way, if you're going to send, uh, I mean, you know, you all buy Tylenol or Excedrin or some kind of pain medication or even food that has an expiration date. So if I pack the spacecraft today, it's not going to launch until maybe next month if we're lucky. And it, it may not be used, that, that, that pill that I'm putting in that package may not get used for two years. Well, how do we keep the expiration for three, four, five years down the road? Some big issues there. Cultural diversity, very important. Autonomy and, of course, extreme conditions. Now, this is a picture of me when I was younger. <laughs> and this is a uh, picture of the Apollo, uh, Apollo uh, the Soyuz transfer module. And you can see it's actually sitting on a, a stand. And you can see inside, so it's right about where my knees are above. That's about how big it is. So if, if in the very near future the space shuttle is not continued and there's an emergency of the six crew members around here, there are two Soyuz capsules on there now. And if there was a fire, like if there's a problem with the uh, heat uh, dissipation unit, there was a leak and they were going to do an EVA tomorrow to fix it. If they have to, to punch out and leave the station abandoned and there's a, a medical emergency, these guys are sitting basically, you know, like they did in an Apollo uh, capsule, very like much like you are right now. And if you're in that kind of a seat setting, it's very difficult to try to, to pry, try and provide medical care uh, or medical um, activities. Now, we also did, uh, following onto our Everest thing, we did do some stuff up at Devon Island uh, uh, with the Mars program. Uh, we actually looked at um, a medical emergency and put in a time delay of 22 minutes to determine. You know, how could you use uh, uh, something like a PDA? And we did some video conferencing on the PDA, which at that time was unheard of, and it actually got published in this uh, journal on the bottom. Okay, so robotics in the last uh, half hour or so, I want to talk about robotics and telesurgery. So I kind of built the stage, or built a, the, um, the platform from, from where this comes from. Uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, there were two robotic companies focusing on uh, developing robots, A, some for NASA, and B, some for DARPA. The DARPA activity, which I'll get to in a minute, was primarily for military applications, but, but computer motion was Yulon Wang out in California. He was developing stuff related to NASA, but they just got this bright idea, well, how can we put this together with surgery? So in the upper left-hand corner is the Zeus robot made by computer motion, and you can see in the sort of picture in the middle, you actually sit at the console and you sort of drive it by just moving your hands. And by, by moving those uh, instruments, you can get the instruments to open and close, you can get them to cut, you can get them to cauterize, and so forth. And the arms then are att attached to the, to the patient bedside. Uh, this patient, been there, laying there a while, I guess, because he's just his chest, but I'm just kidding. Uh, it's actually uh, from computer motion. And then down at the bottom is the uh, Da Vinci, uh, made by Intuitive Surgical. Now, Da Vinci itself was developed by SRI, Stanford Research Institute. Uh, which is now just called SRI. And they developed uh, a different system, and the Da Vinci actually sits on the one side, as you can see in, the, in this, this far right picture. The robot is on this side of the patient with all the arms hanging over, so the arms can move around and do things. And then the surgeon sits at a console in the back. You can see uh, him back there with his uh, little uh, hair bonnet on. So there are, di there are different approaches. One, by the way, could be controlled through the internet. The other one could not. And so that's, that's the basis of how we did, began to do telesurgery. Now, these two companies, only one of them exists now. Uh, back in, uh, it was probably 2003, uh, Computer Motion and Intuitive Surgical were doing a lengthy court battle to determine who was right regarding intellectual property. And just to paraphrase, the, the uh, Computer Motion had voice-activated instruments. So in the operating room, they could say to ESOP, ESOP is an acronym, I mean, I don't need to go down that path, but they could, the surgeon could say, white balance the camera, and the, and the computer would say,